Welcome to lecture five. Uh, the last lecture we had, we discussed the Q value. This was a balance of energy in a reaction, a nuclear reaction. We had two reactants in this binomial reaction. We had two reactants, a light and a heavy particle on the reactant side. And then on the product side, we also had a light and a heavy particle there as well. So the Q value represents the energy due to that balance of mass and tried to uh, highlight the fact that, that they're really the, the procedure of calculating the Q value was not that different from calculating binding energy. And so a Q value is an energy um, units of MeV, for example. Um, and we find that via one of two or three different ways. Uh, the first way is a look at all the rest mass rest masses of the reactants and the products. Uh, the second path to, to determine the Q value we could have been um, binding energies. If we knew the binding energies of the reactants and the products, we could, uh, we could find the Q value that way. Uh, and then finally, if we know the kinetic energies of the reactants and the products, we could calculate a Q value that way. And we would get the same exact answer regardless of which of those three paths we pursued. Uh, generally, uh, we talked about this last time, but generally um, we don't know those kinetic energies, especially of the products. We might know the reactants side of, with kinetic energy, energies, but we, we, need to end up, we end up needing to calculate those kinetic energies of the, of the products. And so the, really the question we're trying to answer today is what else, what, what is the rest of the story there? Um, in order to know whether a reaction could occur or not. And so with the lecture last time, we left off just by saying uh, if, Q, if Q value was positive, then that meant that the reaction had the possibility of occurring. And if it was negative, then we needed to supply some amount of energy in the magnitude of whatever that magnitude of the Q value was. And then that enabled us to, to have that path open now for, as, a, as a reaction that could take place. Uh, but in addition to all that we talked about last lecture, there's a, there's a few other forces, a few other quantities that we need to calculate in certain circumstances, and that's providing the rest of the story, so to speak. And so really the question we're trying to answer here, in addition to the Q value, what else do we need to know in order to predict whether a reaction uh, will occur or, or could occur, I guess we should say there. Um, and one of those forces is the Coulomb force. And that has to do with uh, like charges wanting to repel from each other. And so this comes into play in particular when the uh, projectile on the reactants side of that, uh, that nuclear reaction is a proton or has protons in it like a like an alpha particle and so you have this positively charged uh, projectile being sent towards a target nucleus which obviously has uh, positive charges as well and so that coulomb force wants those two to repel um, but we need to get that projectile close enough to that uh, target nucleus so that the strong nuclear force can take over and it can absorb that, establish that compound nucleus. And so the, the distance um, over which this, this uh, that we need to, to get these two together uh, can be related to each of their uh, atomic numbers. And so how many uh, nucleons the target has, how many nucleons the uh, projectile has, um, and then the, the the average radius of of the uh, of the particles there. But again, the the Coulomb force acts over a certain distance. The strong nuclear force acts over a certain distance, and those two have different um, different strengths depending on how far away you are from each other. Um, but what what ends up happening in this scenario, and again, just just to make this clear. This is only, what we're talking about here with this Coulomb force is not going to come into play when we have just a neutron as the projectile. 
so that that's a neutral charge so these these issues don't come into play uh, if we have a gamma so uh, a, a uh, it doesn't matter what the strength is but if we have a gamma ray as the projectile um, that's not does not have any mass so that's not going to be affected by this either so it's it's primarily or exclusively only when the projectile has one or more protons uh, in it that, that we're going to encounter this. Uh, and when we do have that, this is how, this is how we're going to, uh, to accommodate for it. And so we've got these two um, different sources of energy. We've got the Coulomb energy repulsive, the strong nuclear energy attractive. And so it's the sum of these two that is going to create this, this barrier B here. So that is this, the axis here is, is the y-axis is, is energy in, in MeV or, or some energy unit. And so that is the barrier that we need to overcome. We need to supply at least this magnitude B. This is the Coulomb barrier. And the equation for this is going to be a function of how many neutrons are in the target, how many neutrons are in the projectile, and then the atomic number. And the denominator here comes from that expression for uh, B up in the diagram up above, the distance away between the two. And the units for this when you do this calculation will be MeV. And so you can see that the numerator here is Z, is, is number of protons, number of protons in the projectile, number of protons in the nucleus. And so you, if you do this calculation with just a neutron, then Zx, uh, lowercase x, is zero because there are no protons. And so this goes to zero. And just to, again, highlight the fact that this, this doesn't come into play when we don't have a proton there. So the energy threshold then uh, is the second barrier that we need to discuss and this is different than the Coulomb barrier. What we're going to do is take the expression here that we derived last time um, for the energy of the light uh, product of the reaction. So we've got, this is a function of the energy from the projectile, EX, and the masses of the uh, projectile, and then the two products, the Q value of the reaction, the angle at which the light product is, is going to um, is going to be ejected from that reaction. Knowing all those parameters enables us to calculate that that uh, that energy EY. Uh, but the threshold for this um, is going to occur when phi is zero. And so, if I draw a picture here, this is X. This is capital X, and this could be y and then this is the light reactant or the light product and this was phi that was the angle phi and so when phi is zero that means that the light particle is directly over here right in the wake region right in the in the in back of the the target nucleus. So that is the whatever energy, um, and if you remember from last time we, we plotted this for one of the example problems as that as that uh, as the phi increased from zero to, to pi halves or 90 degrees we saw that this parameter EY started high and then it decreased. And so we what we're looking at is is the worst case scenario, so to speak. So the, the highest energy that the EY is going to be is when uh, phi is zero. 
and then when this here when this is also zero and so we'll say that the threshold occurs when phi is zero and when this parameter here under the the square root here is also zero so let's look at those two together underneath the radical we've got mx mx my the cosine squared of phi equals zero is going to be one and then the denominator here is my plus my times that ex plus q and we want this term this whole thing to equal zero and so I'm going to first get rid of one of these this whole denominator here and I can get rid of the two there and I can isolate the ex And so I'm going to have m x m y over m y plus m y, and then these two cancel out plus m y minus m x. And then I'll carry this through this my multiplied by the q. So it's supposed to be q. So we're trying to solve for this ex because that's what we have control over. That's our projectile. We have some source that's generating alpha particles or some source that's generating neutrons or protons or whatever it is that our projectile is. Uh, we're targeting this uh, larger uh, nucleus with those. And so, um, oh, I forgot an EX up here. No, EX. Um, and so we want to solve this whole expression for that EX because that's going to tell us how much energy we need to supply to that in order for this these terms underneath that square root in order for them to be equal to zero because that again represents the threshold anything lower than that um, is not going to overcome the threshold so we have ex isolated and we can solve this minus q the sum of the reactants And what we're going to do is we'll call this uh, the threshold energy. So what that does for us is again that that helps us that helps us quantify some some bar under which we are not going to uh, reach those that that threshold and and uh, that that radical equals zero. Okay, so. How do we tie all these together? Um, there's a there's a couple of bullet points here that, that help us do that. First of all, we need to calculate the Q value. That is always the first step in a reaction. Calculate the Q value. If it's greater than zero, then that means the nuclear reaction may proceed if the Coulomb barrier condition is satisfied. And so that is... Um, if our projectile energy is greater than or equal to that parameter B, that, that Coulomb barrier. And just as a reminder, this is a non-issue for N or gamma projectile scenarios. We do not have a Coulomb barrier in that case. So for Q less than zero, when we have a negative Q value, 
then up until today's lecture, we would just say, well, we just need to supply that much energy to the projectile in order for that reaction to be a possibility. Uh, but what we're finding out today is we need to calculate two more bits of information. One is the Coulomb barrier, uh, but the second one is this threshold energy. And uh, what we're going to do is we're going to say whatever the largest of either of those two happens to be, that's going to be the uh, projectile energy that we need to supply in order for this to become a possibility. So if, if Q is is greater than zero and it's just a, a neutron or a gamma projectile, then everything we learned up until this lecture is still fully applicable. Um, if Q is greater than zero and we have a proton, well then we have to calculate that Coulomb barrier. If Q is less than zero, then we'll calculate the Coulomb barrier if it's a proton or it has protons in it. Um, but then we also need to calculate this threshold energy. And so we'll go to a, a handful of examples and we're going to come back here after example 5.3. Alright, so for this first example we're looking at a compound nucleus, um, nitrogen 15 to, to be precise, and we can form this in at least 14 different known ways. Uh, there's a handful of them that are shown here, one, two, three, four, five different uh, versions of the reactants that can can be formed to then each generate this this excited nitrogen 15 nucleus and our job is to examine the threshold condition for each of the seven paths listed and so what we'll do um, is we'll first uh, list those paths and then we're going to go to um, our code that we've been writing to to finish um, analyzing all these. So rather than do all this by hand, we're gonna we're gonna have the code do it. And that code again is making use of the table of AMUs where the inputs are Z and A, and the output of that lookup table is just the the mass in AMU. Okay, so for this first reaction, um, we've got boron 11 and we've got helium 4 so that's going to be at alpha and it's the same one for the next uh, the next reaction we just have two different uh, versions of the uh, products and so for this first one the very top one the light particle is going to be a neutron and the heavy particle is going to be nitrogen 14 And for the next one down, we've got hydrogen 1, so that's a proton. And we've got carbon 14 as the heavy product. Now the next one down, we've got tritium, um, and then carbon 12. Carbon 12 is our heavy one. Tritium, we'll, we'll use a capital T for that one. And then um, on the product side, the light particle is a neutron, and the heavy particle is also carbon 14. For our fourth one down and the fifth one down, we have the same uh, reactants. That's going to be carbon-13, and the, uh, the projectile is going to be deuterium, hydrogen-2. And on the other side of that, we've got uh, helium-4, so that's going to be an alpha. And we've got boron-11 on that side. And then we've got tritium, and that's carbon-12. And then for the last two, we've got uh, carbon-14 and a proton. And on the reactant, on the on the uh, product side, we've got neutron and then nitrogen-14. And then the last one is going to be nitrogen 14, a neutron, and then we've got alpha on the other side of that. Okay, so we're going to try to fill out this table. We're going to calculate the Q value. That's, that's always the first step. Um, 
we'll calculate the Coulomb, the Coulomb barrier. Um, you notice the projectiles in each of these cases. I've got alpha, alpha, tritium, deuterium, deuterium, proton. All of those have at least one proton in them. It's only the last one, the neutron, that is my projectile where I can go ahead and just call this zero because I don't have any uh, proton on the, on the projectile side. I have no Coulomb, Coulomb barrier. I'll calculate the Q value. If it's positive, then this is zero. I don't even need to worry about it. If it's negative, I'll need to calculate that. And then based on the numbers in these three columns, we will then make some assessment on what kind of energy we need to supply to the uh, projectile in order to have this reaction be possible. And so this is, uh, again, we're not going to be doing this by hand. Um, we're going to use the programs that we've been developing uh, starting last lecture. Um, so here is the one for example 5.1. And because my lookup table for masses um, needs Z and A as inputs, that's what I'm going to um, use here. And so I go down the list and I'm going to create a vector for each of these that's seven elements long because I have seven reactions. And I'm going to input Z and A both for the reactants and for the products. And so the first up is the reactant uh, proton number. And so I look at this list and I've got boron, boron, carbon, 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 and then nitrogen. So boron has five uh, protons, carbon has six, and then nitrogen has seven. And so I just have five, five, six, 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 and then seven. And then I look at my projectile, and I ask myself, how many protons do I have there? Well, I've got an alpha, alpha, tritium, deuterium, deuterium, proton, neutron. So alpha has two, so two, and then two. Tritium has one proton, deuterium has one proton, so one, one, one. And then my sixth one is a proton, so that's also a one. And my, my seventh one is a neutron, so I have no protons there. And now I go and I look at the uh, reactant, uh, the total number of nucleons there. That's, that's my A. And this is part of the problem statement for uh, part of the reaction. It's just listed there. So it's boron 11, boron 11. That number is the number of nucleons. And so I just read that right off, row 1 to row 7, 11, 11, 12, 13, 13, 14, 14. And then I uh, look at the uh, reactant uh, projectile again, and I say, okay, that's a that's we've got alpha and alpha, so that's four nucleons. Four tritium has a three, and deuterium those each have two. Uh, my th sixth one is a proton, so that has one, um, and my neutron is also one nucleon. So then I go do and I go and do the same thing for the product side, and um, you can you can prove to yourself that this is following that same process: nitrogen, carbon, carbon, boron, carbon, nitrogen, boron, and the number of nucleons. Uh, same story there. So I got I have these vectors for my protons for both of my reactants and, and, and A for both of my reactants and the same story for my products. And so I can now step through these, one through seven, that's what this is doing here. And these first four lines, I just go to my lookup function and I say, okay, here's the Z, here's the A, tell me what the mass is. And that's in units of AMU. And once I have those, my Q value is just easy to calculate by that mass balance and difference and that's in units of AMU so I want to get that to MEV so multiply by 931.5 and so I've got my Q value and this will again record this for every one of the seven uh, reactions that I'm considering here and then I'll calculate my Coulomb threshold or my, my Coulomb barrier that capital B and I will use the uh, Z's and A's that I have already specified up there and these will also step through uh, as I go one through seven and then I say if Q is greater than zero if it have a positive Q value I don't need to calculate this threshold energy 
If it's negative, then I will calculate it according to this uh, equation that I had that was given in the notes as well. And so I can just take this now and run it. And I've got now seven values for Q. In fact, let's just look at these right next to each other. Q, B, and EXT. Oops, I didn't need to do that. Let's do it this way. All right, so that first column is Q. Next column is my Coulomb barrier. And the third column is my threshold energy. And so I've got, now I've got numbers I can fill in my table. So once I have my data and my tables all filled out, now I can fill in this last column where I need to, to make some decision or, or make some conclusion about what I need for that energy to the projectile. And in the case of positive Q values, this is always just going to be greater than or equal to that Coulomb barrier. And so this is going to be the same for all of those because it's positive. Um, but now I need to, for the next two lines, I need to compare these two values. And I take whichever one of those is, is bigger. And in this case, the Coulomb barrier is larger. And so this actually is going to be the same as the ones just above it. Um, but then as I go down here to my final reaction, I have zero for my Coulomb barrier. Therefore, this requirement here is just that I am larger than that threshold energy. And so now I know in each of these reactions what kind of energy I need to supply to the projectile in order for these reactions to be a possibility. So hopefully you're starting to see the advantage of creating these little calculators. Um, and in this case, I just have some simple AM. It's just one AMU lookup function. Um, but I could create a, a Q value. Not that, it's, not that it's hard to program that in, but, but I could create a Q value uh, function. Um, I, have the, uh, I could create a, a function here for my for my Coulomb barrier, I could create another one for my threshold energy, and I could just, I could just say, you know what? Here's my, here's my Z's and my A's for my reactants, and my Z's and my A's for my products, and just tell me everything. And so I, I could create another function where these are these are the inputs, and it just recognizes how many rows I have, and or how many elements long this vector is, and and then just spit out the information I need. So for this next example, uh, we want to consider the neutron detection reaction. So we've got tritium being targeted by a neutron. And on the product side, we've got, I'm not I'm sorry, we didn't have tritium. We had, we had helium-3 on the uh, reactant side uh, being targeted by a neutron. And on the, on the output, we have tritium and a proton. And so we first, again, the first step is always to find the Q value. And if we find out that, that that's a negative, then we should calculate the threshold energy. Uh, automatically, I'm seeing that since this is a neutron, um, I am not going to need to worry about this Coulomb barrier. Okay, and then we want to know what are the expected energies of the products when both reactant kinetic energies are neglected. So. So this means here that we're assuming EX equals E capital X equals zero. And then we want to explore and plot both of these. Uh, these are the product energies over the range from zero to 10 MeV for different angles. And so we'll be using that expression and if you recall, last lecture, we had a function that's just going to evaluate that for us anyway. So we just use that function, and uh, we should be able to calculate all these, all these parameters. But let's, let's uh, also, we need to create a plot here. And so let's come back to our code that, we're, that we've been developing. And so with this one reaction, we don't have to consider seven reactions like we did last time. We just have, we just have 
one reaction. So this number of protons in my in my large in my target is two. That's my helium three, um, and so I have a total number of nucleons of three there. My uh, projectile is a neutron, so I have zero protons and one nucleon. The uh, products are a proton, and so I have one proton in a proton and one nucleon, and then uh, tritium. And so I have one proton and a total of three nucleons. And so just with that information, I can go again look up my with my lookup function and, and just get my masses, calculate my Q value, in this case I decided to do this with a function and there's nothing special about this function other than exactly what you would think it looks like mx plus mx minus my minus my and then multiply it by that 931.5 to get me into MeV so I get my Q value um, and then the problem statement asks us to consider 0, 45, 90 and 135 and 180 for our angles I'm going to convert those into radians and I want to create a vector for these uh, the energies of my projectile from 0 all the way to the 10 uh, per the problem statement again and uh, this is just initializing those variables and so then I'm going to, I'm going to loop through these uh, these angles and then for each angle I'm going to do a sub loop through all of the energies that I'm considering, 0 to 10. And so they'll create a two-dimensional vector, so a matrix of e EY of the light product and EY for the heavy product. And so this then is my function, if you remember this from last time, this is uh, using that standard function to calculate the energy for my light particle of the product side, and here are the inputs there and I just need to be careful to step into step through my energies in the X and then step through my uh, angles in the in the for phi and then whatever I get for e y little y I can calculate my the energy of the, uh, the kinetic energy for the massive or the large particle as just Q minus e y minus e x and we're looking for plots and so at the end of this I'm going to have a matrix of EY and a matrix of, of lowercase EY and, and uppercase EY and I want to plot the results and on the x-axis I want that energy from 0 to 10 and then for figure 1 I want to plot the uh, E of the light particle and then do the same thing with E of the uh, heavy particle and so I can just run this now And here are my uh, results. So this is my heavy particle, this is the light particle. And there's nothing here out of the ordinary. We, we see that the larger that I supply the, uh, the projectile energy, then the larger energy that I get out of the, uh, the small and the large, for that matter, um, uh, product. And so I've got uh, 0 degrees, 45, 90, and so I start out higher for any given fixed value of EX. I'm going to start high, and then as I increase that angle, then this gets lower and lower and lower. And We saw this last time in, in, a, in the example in Chapter 4, or the Lecture 4. And the opposite is true for the large particle. So I start low, and I increase, and I get higher and higher as I go from 0 to 180 there. And so there's really, there's not much of an additional story to tell here. There's nothing here out of the ordinary. Um, we've created the plot so we can copy those into the, into the solutions um, easily enough. Um, but that's, that's pretty much what we're looking for on that example. And as we go to the next example, actually we should probably... Um, write down that Q value. Q was 0 0.7638. Um, and then it's asked specifically for the expected energies 
when the kinetic energies were zero from the reactant side. And so all I need to do is look at my very first one. of those elements. So when EX equals E capital X equals zero, then I have EY equal to 0 0.5725 MeV. And the energy of my large, rea uh, large product is 0 0.1913 MeV. So there we, and if we copy those figures now into there, we've, we've completely answered that question. So now if I look at my, at my final one, we're gonna look at a neutron production reaction instead of a neutron detection reaction. And so in this case, we've got the following reaction. We want to again find the Q value, um, and if we need to find the Coulomb barrier, and seeing that this is a proton, I can see that I am going to need to uh, calculate that Coulomb barrier. Uh, and the reaction threshold, that's going to be needed if I find the Q value is negative. Uh, in the previous example, the Q value is not negative, so we didn't need to calculate the reaction threshold. So, um, and we're looking at some of the same things. So what are the expected energies when these two are neglected? and explore and plot these over the same ranges. So if we come back here, we're gonna do the same thing. All we really had to do in this case was change the number of protons and nucleons for the reactants and the products uh, to reflect the, the, uh, the reaction that we're dealing with here. So we have lithium-7 uh, as the target. So if lithium is, has three protons, and lithium-7, so I have seven nucleons. Uh, the small, the, the uh, projectile is a proton, so I have one proton there, one nucleon. And then I have beryllium-7. And so my, my, my protons is four, my total number of nucleons is seven, and it's a neutron that's coming out of there. So I have zero protons and one nucleon. But the rest of this is the same. I mean, I look up my, I use my lookup functions there. I calculate my Q value. I find the Coulomb barrier energy, find the threshold energy requirement in this case, um, and, um, and then create my vectors just like I did before, and march through just like I did before, and plot just like I did before. And so there's really nothing new in terms of the coding. I just find something new when I plot them. And so we've got this whole region here between up to about two MeV, that's giving us uh, it's giving us odd results, uh, and so it's almost as if we start we're starting the uh, the true characterizations at this point, and so the the conclusion is here. We're going to dive into the equation here in just a minute, but but the conclusion on this graphical uh, analysis is that. I don't want anything probably below 2 MeV. Uh, if I want to create, to establish a neutron um, and generate a neutron of predictable energy, then I better have at least 2 MeV coming in from that proton as my, in my uh, projectile. So this most likely has a negative Q value, and it does. Um, so Q equals negative 1.6442. Um, my Coulomb barrier is 1.2359 and then my threshold energy is 1.88. And so this 1.88, this is going to be related to, um, it's going to be related to that, that point on the graph that we saw that that uh, we it seemed like we shouldn't have anything below and that makes sense that so we, we shouldn't have anything below 1.88 uh, but there's there's some additional there's some additional analysis that we'll go back and look at the expression for that EY with the with the quadratic and try to understand if, if this is our limit or if there's some other limit that we need to be worried about 
Um, but clearly if I have zero, if I neglect my reactant kinetic energy, so I have EX and E capital X of zero, then I'm gonna get nonsensical answers. I'm, I, I have a negative Q value, so if I don't supply any energy there, this isn't gonna happen. And so I need to, uh, th that's the answer to that one, and I can create my plots um, and, and copy and paste those in for my solutions as well. But let's take a look at this, this expression here to kind of make some more sense of what we saw in uh, example 5.3. And so what we're looking at here is this parameter, we'll call this b. This is just b squared. And then we'll call this right here, we'll call this whole thing um, A. And because Q is negative, the, um, the, the parameter we really want to look at here is, is the, the expression there. And so when, when my threshold energy for instance, when that threshold energy equals minus Q times MY over MY minus MX, when that happens, then this whole term here goes away. And I'm left with, and I'm left with uh, EY to the one half equals B plus or minus B squared square root. And so this is, this is where it starts to be problematic. And so in our example here, this thing is in 5.3, this uh, negative Q over MY over MY minus MX. This is going to equal 1.920 MeV. And so we compare that to what we had for the threshold energy of 1.88. And this now is our new limit. Right? Anything below this is going to cause uh, there to be more than one, more than one uh, available energy, not, not just mathematically, but, but in actuality. And so if I want to... Um, if I want to create neutrons at predictable energies, then I'd better be above this value. And in the textbook, this is called EX prime. And so when is this applicable? It's only applicable when I have a negative Q value. Because uh, you saw from the previous example, example 5.2, that we didn't encounter this at all. It, it, the, the behavior was just as we had expected to be very predictable. In, in other words, for every uh, MeV value for EX, I had one and, and one only option for EY. In this case, I'd have two. And so I want to be above that so that I can get into the land where, again, I, I have one predictable value for, for that EY. Because if this is a neutron generator, I want to generate neutrons at predictable energies. And so I, I better have my proton above a certain energy level in order to uh, have a, a good reliable neutron generator is the bottom line here. So once we get above 1.92 um, then we start to see more predictable behavior and, and it's consistent with the expectations. Um, I have a reliable uh, prediction I can make there. So. Alright, well this concludes lecture 5. Um, we'll see you for lecture six.